Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. Hey, Jack, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, hi, Steve. Okay, good. Uh, looking through a couple of the other comments, uh, a few of the attendees are interested in uh, your view of the U.S. dollar against the Canadian, your view of the, the U.S. Uh, against the New Zealand, uh, and also, I guess the last one was uh, the uh, Euro North versus Euro South. I guess you commented a, a bit about that, but how would that actually happen? Uh, in in terms of leaving? Yeah, I mean, so they leave, and then they all form their own sort of southern euro, whatever they call it. Um, no, they'll go back to their individual currencies. Okay. Greece will go back to the drachma. Um, Portugal will go back to the escudo. Uh, Spain, the Pesetas, and Ireland, the punt. And it would be great for currency traders, you know, that used to trade all that stuff before the euro. <laughs> right, 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 right. So they'll go back to the regular, the regular gotcha. okay. uh, currencies is, is, is what um, it most likely would, would happen there. And maybe the euro comes apart entirely if Germany is the trigger for this. Um, if it doesn't, maybe it reforms, as I said, uh, you know, as the euro of that northern tier. And, and if it is, it, it will come back as a much stronger currency. Um, as to the New Zealand, you know, trying not to parse it too much, uh, New Zealand dollar pretty much with continued to move with the Australian dollar. On a relative basis, New Zealand is not a, near as good, you know, a financial condition as Australia. But it will tend to move as a commodity, you know, currency with Australia pretty closely. So if Australia continues to rally, we expect New Zealand to do the same. If Australia breaks, we expect the same. Um, Canadian dollar, um, it's a little bit of a difference because of its, you know, still primary dependence on the U.S. Um, if the U.S. does well relative, and there's a problem in China, um, we could see the Canadian dollar from a commodity basket, we would expect it to weaken against the U.S. dollar, but weaken uh, more slowly than something like New Zealand and Australia that are more exposed to China. So, so there are ways to play that, that if, if, if we see a break in China and you just don't want to play as a pure play you know, U.S. dollar um, you know, against Australia or something, you can maybe you know, cross you know, Canada against you know, Australia because we don't think it would hit quite as hard. But same token, we haven't seen Canadian dollar appreciate nearly as much uh, as the Australian dollar, which makes the case for what I just said on the flip <laughs> side. Um, but either way, if there's a break in the commodities um, complex, um, we think the, the Canadian dollar gets hit. We actually think the Canadian dollar bottom may be in. Um, and f just looking at our you know weekly longer term wave stuff that we do, which you know I don't want to get too nutty with this. Um, we think the the Canadian dollar is going to depreciate, um, continue to depreciate against the U.S. dollar, regardless of what happens um, to the rest of the commodities block going forward. Is there another question in there, Steve? Uh, no. Um, that's the few that I read. Can you continue to read through, and I'll try to help you on some. Sure. Um, Recent announcement uh, from China and Russia would now conduct trade um, uh, without the U.S. dollar. Um, well, we've seen this before, um, and that's not a surprise. And, and we think if globalization and, and, and all this stuff continues, there's no doubt around the edges you'll, you'll see more and more of that. The U.S. dollar just in general will probably lose uh, – if China continues to grow, the, and, and, we, and the emerging markets continue to grow as they are, you'll see more and more of that with China um, of these individual blocks and trades. But there's no way uh, in God's green earth that China is ever going to displace, displace uh, the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency, <clears throat> probably in our lifetime. And we wrote about that last month um, 
in the currency investor. You hear these people, you hear these nutballs, nut jobs that write newsletters and say the U.S. dollar is going to go away, uh, China is going it, to. It's it's absolute nonsense. These people just do this in order to sell newsletters and create fear. If you look at the numbers, China just does not pump out the reserve base to do it. They have a closed capital account. They basically still have a slave labor camp in the country, um, and they don't want to give their consumers the ability to, to move money offshore and give them freedoms. So until you have a major cultural shift in China over a long-term basis, you know, 20, 30 years, um, you're not going to see a big challenge, but you will see these little games going on. But don't don't confuse this and, you, you know, a natural pro- process of the U.S., being held less and less around the world because of growth of the outlying countries relative to the U.S., which is a natural problem. Don't confuse that with China taking over in terms of the, you know, it's it's just a silly thing. Um, it's a fear type thing, as I said, by most of the nut job newsletter writers to force you into doing something. Um, I, my de- my detest for most of those guys is uh, showing, so I apologize. <laughs> um, do you think the outlook for national currency eurozone was? Uh, I think I covered that pretty much. Oh, my thought. Um, World Trade, WTC, uh, World Trade Organization's estimate of 4 to 4.5%. Um, slowdown in China. If if China grows at 5, 5% instead of 9 and 10%, it's a major disaster for China. Um, and that's part of what we're saying, that you a slowdown in the range of, you know, back to 7, 6, 7 percent puts major, major pressure on China from a social standpoint um, and changes the dynamics for the commodity countries uh, in the world and changes the dynamics for the commodity currencies relative to the U.S. dollar. So we don't even need to see a growth disaster in China, we don't think, um, but just see a, an inevitable slowdown um, given where they are um, and, and, we, and, we, and we really think part of the political belligerence you're seeing externally from China, what they're doing in the South China Sea and everything else, um, is part of this creating more nationalism because of the tensions growing inside the country. It's a game they, they play at times like this. So it tells us that, that they are starting, or at least it gives us an indication that they may be starting to slow. Um, with a rise in U.S. dollar, will have a positive effect in the U.S. stock market, um, commodities in the near term. We wrote a piece uh, a couple of years ago just comparing the potential for a new U.S. dollar bull market, comparing it to what went on in the 1990s. And although it's not uh, yet analogous, the point being that you can have a rising currency and a rising stock market. This idea that you have to have a falling currency to have a rising stock market just because it went on in this past cycle. Um, it's not set in concrete. Uh, in fact, um, a rising stock market that's based on real wealth growth within a country is very, very positive for the, for the currency. What I mean by that is you draw in foreign direct investments um, because of the capital appreciation potential um, and the cheapness of the assets inside the country. Um, and you tend to see them start to move together. That's a healthy process, um, you know, in and of its own right. What's not a healthy process is the idea of debasing the U.S. dollar and making your citizens um, less, you know, poorer relative to the rest of the world in order to pump up the financial side of your economy, even though you're losing more and more money overseas and the real investment and real growth and real um, productive assets is taking place overseas. Um, that's unhealthy. What we've seen um, from 2000 um, on. So, you know, we're hoping we 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 see exactly that. The foreign direct investment coming back into the U.S. Um, a change in restructuring the U.S. economy. Most people think it can't happen, but it can happen. Um, you know, we just have to make some some minor policy adjustments, and and that's the advantage really the U.S. really has over every nation it competes with. The U.S. still has the ability to regenerate itself. Um, they've done it again and again and again because we still have the entrepreneur in the U.S. And the other countries don't have that same culture. So to say the U.S. is, you know, is just history um, is just silly. And, in fact, if you, if you believe that, I suggest you read that uh, Robert Friedman's book um, who writes for Stratford.com called The Next Hundred Years. 
talks about the renewal that he believes the U.S. will, will take, and, and we believe that, too. Um, we're talking about longer-term events, obviously. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.